What's up, everybody? We are back. John Delarose here, the leading Hispanic voice in science fiction with a improbable review. Sometimes I just pick up books and start reading them. And that's what happened here with this Invincible Iron Man Omnibus. This is by Kurt Busiek and Sean Chen. Um, and is right after Heroes Reborn, where they relaunched all the titles. The Heroes started uh, by image creators for like, they lent like 12, 13 issues. They were gone, they were out of the Marvel Universe. Image creators had their own universe, they brought them back. Uh, and, you know, said they were just hidden in a pocket universe for that year or whatever. And this is where they've come back. Um, Iron Man 1988, all new, collectible number one, which, uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you can find it at a dollar bin at this point, uh, through 25. Uh, and of course, some crossover events because they crossed over these stories all the time, obnoxiously. I'm glad they collected them, though, because uh, I have a couple of these omnibuses. There's one, uh, Amazing Spider-Man by John Byrne, and it doesn't collect the crossovers. It just has the book, and then you don't finish the story. It's it's uh, sad when that happens. And it's got um, uh, Iron Man, Iron Age 1 and 2 at the end, which I'll talk about later. Pretty big omnibus. Um, now, the Heroes Return era was very interesting. Um, they really, I don't know, they, they reset a lot of the characters in a lot of ways. So everybody's trying to, like, Iron Man's trying to hide his secret identity again, and... Uh, you know, of course, people magically don't know that he's Iron Man, even though he and Iron Man disappeared together. It's, you know, I mean, it, it, it didn't quite work out on that level, uh, rationally. But um, we have the reset, Iron Man going out and doing Iron Man fighting. Kurt Busiek does a pretty good job, um, both just of, like, telling a general comic story, so where you get an issue in a story, you get the nice Tony Stark uh, playboy drama, and then uh, you get a full story in an issue. And so he goes and has to fight. Iron Man shows up. And it, there's a few issues like this. And we're resetting uh, the world. So now Stark is not in control of his company anymore. Uh, I'm just going through him, you know, scrolling through the pages. Um, he now has like this like Stark Solutions, not Stark Industries, which was bought by a competitor. And his Solutions is like mostly a charitable organization. Uh, and I guess he's just got enough money, he doesn't really care, so he does everything for charity. He keeps getting attacked uh, on different vacations and things like this. And they bring back some old villains uh, for you to uh, deal with. Now, uh, this setup happens, uh, he starts hanging out with this, uh, this gal, Rumiko, who is a uh, competitor's daughter. And she's just, acts like a fun-loving gal, but she's a lot smarter than she seems on the surface. Uh, no matter where they go, they seem to get attacked. And here's here's the Rumiko issues. It's a, actually a pretty good uh, pretty good storyline. I like the character a lot of, of Rumiko. Um, and of course, I'm sure uh, once Busiek's gone off the deal, she gets abandoned because that's how how these new characters and, and love interests and things like that go. Um, and that's the problem with modern comics these days, which I, I don't like. It's always it's always just a reset after reset after reset. So the stories don't mean much. And even in the context of this omnibus, the stories don't tend to mean much. Iron Man has his fight. Uh, there's a mystery of who's sending all the villains. And eventually, you know, he goes and, and finds said mystery. In a, and partially he does a team up with Black Widow, you know, to kind of bring back the member berries of Black Widow a little bit. This is a good one. Um, I like Sean Chen's art. Should I talk about Sean Chen's art a little bit? I should. Um, he's got a pretty solid style. Um, which is just nice. I would say it's like, he's got a little bit of John Romita Jr. in him, but he doesn't like push it all the way to where Romita does these boxy things. Um, and so he's, you know, it's, it's a little easier to read in a lot of ways than when those heavy John Romita Jr. issues happen. That's kind of, uh, it's kind of nice. So uh, I like it. I like Sean Chen's art for the most part. It definitely has that like 90s coloring scheme where uh, you know, uh, they, they try to be a little more detailed than before, and it kind of works out sometimes, kind of doesn't. Um, but pretty good. The way he draws Iron Man himself as, as a costume has a little pointier of uh, a mask, and I actually like the way it looks a lot. A subplot starts throughout this with um, Mockingbird. It's who is she at this point? Warbird. Sorry, she's Warbird, not Miss Mo Marvel Mockingbird, whatever. Uh, she's Warbird now, even though she's wearing the Miss Marvel costume. 
and uh, she's in here and she's struggling with alcoholism so Tony's like not wanting her to go down that path it's a it's a pretty decent storyline and I don't think that ever gets mentioned anymore in the uh, in the modern stuff so uh, you know it overall each one of these issues is a superhero uh, deal uh, this is a four-parter that goes in here and uh, you know that the, the quick silver, silver volume wasn't quite as good um, we get some Avengers in here really get a lot of Miss Marvel in this or whatever her name is at this point and um, it's, it's about a Kree attack so the crossovers are all right um, and it just keeps going so eventually Tony Stark gets into I mean I've already kind of talked about the art a little bit um, this is a funky piece of art. I don't. I don't know what's up with the face here or the look. Black Widow. Um, weird. Maybe it was trying to get that underwater effect and didn't quite work out. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it does. Not everybody's 100%. For, for the most part, I like Tron Chen's art. Um, eventually, Iron Man moves to Seattle and moves his base of operations to Seattle. Um, oh yeah, they bring back that Fing Fan Foom deal through this giant robot. Um, and this was pretty nice. Uh, yeah, so the Mandarin's controlling this giant robot, and the Mandarin was kind of behind all this the whole time. They have a big fight. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, eventually Iron Man wins. But he moves to, uh, like I said, he moves to Seattle. Uh, it turns out there's this, like, plot thread for a bit where the Iron Man armor is, uh, actually eating at him. And it's, you know, his bones are becoming brittle, and he's gonna die. And we get, of course, this crossover with Modoc. Um, I love Modoc. I love saying Modoc, Modoc. <laughs> um, and a little more standard comic art here, which I actually like the transition in this annual uh, quite a bit. I think it's, uh, I like this style of art a little better. Um, and then we get back into this again. Um, the Mockingbird thing keeps developing. Uh, there's a Madame Mask mystery going on. This doesn't resolve, but uh, Madame Mask is I guess, replacing other Madame Masks of the past, and they're dying. There's a mystery war machine for a while who shows up and fights Iron Man, and it's not Rhodey, it's somebody else. And, uh, you know, we find out who it is uh, later on, and it all works. All kind of closes, but it's all kind of forgettable stuff. And even the even the Iron Man, like, that was a pretty neat concept that the Iron Man armor is actually killing him, and if he gets into it, it's going to kill him. And for a few issues, he just, like, stopped being in it. And then, like, they just kind of abandoned that plot thread, which was a bummer. We get more of that Rumiko romance. Rumiko gets mad because he always runs off. She starts thinking he's a coward and all that uh, and doesn't know what's going on with him. Um, is the deal with that. But the art stays consistent throughout the whole deal because it is, I mean, really, to the credit, Sean Chen, like, really knocked out almost all of this, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, doesn't happen very often. We've got Salvador uh, La Roca on a Fantastic Four crossover. I didn't like the Fantastic Four crossover so much. I thought it was kind of kind of odd. Um, but it keeps going, and you know, just standard superhero fare. It's all right. It's all good. You get some villains who kind of remember villains I don't always remember because I don't really know much about Iron Man. So I just see uh, I just see some of these villains. And then they drop that they drop that plot thread. So eventually Tony Stark just keeps getting into oh here's Fang Fang Poom. Um and uh he fights off the dragon here. That's this is a fun issue. And what's interesting is Roger Stern starts at co-plotting and scripting about halfway through this. I don't know if Kurt Busiek just got too busy or whatnot. I think the stories kind of get a little better when Roger Stern's involved. Uh it's pretty neat here. Um and uh, I enjoy the Fin Fang Foom stuff. Um and all of this. And then uh, Roger Stern likes to throw giant things at him. So we, we resolve the Warbird thing, find out who Warbird, or not Warbird, um, War Machine, War Machine, Warbird, jeez. Um, find out it's somebody fake in the armor and Tony Stark finally wins with Iron Man, which is nice. Um, and then uh, Rumiko and her this is a bad scan. Yeah, this happened at a point in the book, and I can't remember which issue this is, but this whole issue has like kind of like a low resolution to it compared to the others in the book. And I don't know what happened with this one. This is uh, Iron Man Annual 99. Um, it doesn't really go along with the rest of the storyline. It's got its own 
sort of self-contained thing, and that's the rough part about annuals. Again, these are just like one-offs, and then uh, Iron Man's uh, teaming up with a shield agent uh, to fight some stuff. And look at this, this low resolution. You can't really see it on my phone, maybe, but um, it's really washed out colors in this, and um, the scans like just like don't look very good uh, in person for this entire annual. It's bothersome. Um, and then we get back to it. So we have a big uh, eighth day uh, crossover at this point, and uh, basically the Juggernaut and some other people like uh, have all these mystical items, and they're gonna you know destroy the world together, and, and everybody has to kind of get in and fight them together. Then this Stark Fujikawa group that Rumiko's father runs uh, is actually powering like their big boat because of uh, we're still on the eighth day. I'm just kind of getting through that. Here's John Romita Jr.'s uh, art as a comparison. So he's kind of got like, Sean Chen's kind of got that really almost boxy look. Um, but John Romita just takes it to the next step, which both makes his art more unique, which makes it more interesting in some ways. Uh, but it also makes it kind of harder to read some points because it's, it's distracting sometimes um, compared to Sean Chen. It ends with a strange juggernaut one-off and all the people team up and the juggernaut even teams up against those evil people and they eventually blast everything away at the end. Um, so like I said, these these are just, this is a period of the 90s. I feel like after Onslaught, they were, they were just really too scared of changing the characters too much and like progressing the characters. I think they realized they went too far in too many titles and they had to kind of dial things back because they were dialing up their movie licenses and all this. And so all of these are just one-offs that like, they don't really impact anything, even a few issues into Iron Man. Like, you know, there's no problem with him donning the Iron Man costume anymore. He's he's just back at it. Um, but uh, Rumiko's father is, uh, is running his ship off of Ultimo, the giant robot at this point. So this is why I say Roger Stern likes to do these giants. He did uh, Big Fin Fin Foom, you know, rampaging, you know, sort of Godzilla story, I guess, where, where uh, Iron Man fights him, and now we have Ultimo uh, fighting, and we get really deep into this uh, um, Carol Danvers alcoholism at this point. It, it has built up and escalated throughout this. I mean, a little over the, you know, it, it, they, they were definitely tried to make their point, and it went, you know, a little cheesy on that end, but it was okay. But she ends up fighting Iron Man while she's blackout drunk. She's so blackout drunk that she's like, F you, Iron Man, and she fights him. Uh, and uh, then eventually they have to team up anyway and uh, and defeat Ultimo before he destroys Tacoma. Now, the reason that uh, Kurt Busiek uses Washington and Seattle and all that as a new base of operations is because he actually is from there. Um, and uh, so I guess he just wanted to write, you know, home rather than like a New York story, which makes sense, uh, at least to me. And that's it for, uh, for this whole deal. They, they fight up Ultimo, kind of call it a day, uh, uh, and then she finally, after uh, a while, checks into an AA meeting with Tony. Uh, that's good as Carol Danvers. That's a weird looking face there also. Um, and that kind of resolves that storyline. And that's the end of the omnibus, except for the Iron Age. Now this is actually the coolest part of the omnibus. Uh, when I got to this story, I was very stoked and we got a different artist here, Patrick Zercher, uh, on these. And this is like a historical Iron Man. So it's like the first issue is Pepper Potts recalling when Iron Man came on the scene, how Tony Stark hired her, and like uh, this plot that kind of uh, developed uh, with the saboteur to like take down uh, Stark Industries. Very cool stuff. I actually like Patrick Zercher's art a little better than Sean Chen's also, just a little more traditional um, on uh, the facial structures and things like that. Um, and I thought float a little nice. Now, Sean Chen has a little more dynamics. There's a little more action. And you see that Patrick Zercher, Zercher is not quite as action-packed, I guess, uh, in his layouts. Um, which is okay. Uh, this works very well for this kind of story. So, uh, very enjoyable. Um, I, I thought this was a great little past. I really got into the character of Pepper Potts in that a lot more than I did actually uh, during this. Um, now, even though the Rumiko romance happened, it kind of just like fizzled and went away and they started like teasing a Pepper Potts thing, but they kissed and called each other friends, it, you know. So, you know, it's it's the standard 
you know, we're gonna pretend to develop a, a romantic plot and then take it away and then not really develop it. Like that illusion of change comic book fair. And that's that's my whole problem with this omnibus. Everything was illusion of change and it kind of resets and it so slowly resets that you kind of almost don't notice it, but it really does. Um, and so uh, it's rough uh, because there's no real character development. Uh, even though Kurt Busiek does a pretty good job, and he does it, he has such a deep knowledge of the history that he he references things from all over the the historical past, brings back different villains. I mean, you got to give him credit on that. And um, even though editorial does things that make it difficult to change these characters from this point forward, this is really the decline of comics in general because of the editorial standpoints. Not his fault. The second issue of the Iron Age is from Happy Hogan's uh, perspective, who's Iron Man's chauffeur. And uh, he came into contact with Iron Man and saw this whole deal going down, got involved with it, and uh, and deals with a, a, a fake Tony Stark who shows up and uh, helps uh, Iron Man solve that. So very good. I enjoyed these two issues a lot. This, these two little historical issues that uh, Busiek did that were uh, really a lot of references to the, the old Tales of Suspense stuff plus uh, a, a nice fresh take and a fresh story in each one of them uh, was uh, was just very delightfully done. So I enjoyed that uh, more than more than the regular run. Some extras in the back with some you know variant covers and things like that thrown in here. And that's all you get for the omnibus. So the good news about this was it is a very quick read. So what happens is after Ed Zero Heroes Reborn is like the tone of comics kind of change and there's a lot less dialogue per page and so, uh, and, and a lot, and the decompression starts to happen. Now, it's not full decompressed. Each issue still has its own story in this. Uh, so we're not there yet, but uh, but we're, we're back to just like the reset mode where, where they're really not wanting to take risks with the character or do anything different, which makes it, you know, okay. Um, now, I wasn't gonna get this, I don't know. Uh, I never read this era ever before. I never read Iron Man, really. Um, and so, uh, but I saw this, uh, somebody was selling it for 35 bucks for an omnibus is absolutely crazy. So if you can find a deal on it, uh, definitely get it. Fine read, it's, it's just okay. Um, I probably won't remember anything from this book that happened uh, in a month, <laughs> and that's just how it is. So uh, 6.5 out of 10, little little below average, but I do enjoy Kurt Busiek's plotting. I do enjoy Sean Chen's art. It's just, uh, you know, it just felt like editorial wouldn't let them uh, really do much other than keep that classic mode of the character going. Uh, you know, which, which you find happens in a lot of the resets of the characters. Uh, you see this with Spider-Man once it gets to that brand new day stage after they uh, kind of torched uh, the character and had a problem with him there. Seems like every time they have one of these events, whether it be Onslaught screwing up the characters or uh, one more day screwing up the characters, they just like really play it, dial it back to this like reset mode where there's really no character development. Um, and it's just sad. But... Um, you know, I read a little bit of Iron Man, kind of understand Iron Man a little bit more, and it was all right. So I guess that's all I can ask for out of a comic book. All right, hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed my review. I will be back later with more comic reviews and writing talk and things like that. See you guys.